In the last video, we had a brief look at phonology and how it can help us understand how sounds behave and change. We also used our knowledge to infer a common origin to the various question words found in English, Hindi, French and Greek. With the basic knowledge of phonology from that video, we quickly ran into a brick wall in terms of how much we can understand what was going on. In this video, we're going to dive a little deeper into phonology, understand a few more speech sounds and finally, take a look at how sounds can change over time. Don't worry, I am here to help. But first, let's look at a quick problem. Here are the words for foot and three in English, Spanish, Hindi and Greek. In both sets, you get nearly the exact same consonants in Spanish, Hindi and Greek, but something different in English. This happens the exact same way for the words father and tooth. Why is English so different from the others? By the end of this video, you'll have a better understanding of what is going on. So far, we know about these nine sounds. If you want a quick recap, take a look at the introduction to linguistics on this channel. Time to introduce some terminology. The p, b and m are all bilabial since their point of articulation is the two lips, bilabial. The t, d and m are alveolar because their point of articulation is where the tongue touches the alveolar ridge. This one's a bit tricky, so I remember it as a tricky one and associate it with the letter T. The k, g and n are velar, as they are produced when the tongue touches the velum. Don't confuse this with alveolar, they are quite different. So you have bilabial, alveolar and velar. These can be difficult to remember at the start, so I will colour code it to make it easier, but you'll get the hang of it over time. But in between bilabial, alveolar and velar, there are even more points of articulation. Let's have a look at them, using fricatives as examples. Remember, fricatives are produced when airflow passes through a tiny aperture formed in the mouth and undergoes friction. So let's look at f and v. Instead of the two lips, the air flows through an aperture between the upper teeth and lower lip. This means they are labiodental. Of course, V is voiced and F is voiceless. Next, take a look at these weird letters. All they represent are th and th, which you find in the words thing and father. They are different sounds with a difference in voicing, just spelt the same. Anyway, instead of behind your teeth, stick your tongue between your teeth and blow. The th and th sounds you get are interdental between teeth. Th is voiced and th is voiceless. This explains why brother is increasingly pronounced brother in Essex and West Country dialects, as well as AAVE and others. This change occurs in the word bath, which is pronounced bath in these dialects. The point of articulation simply shifts forward from an interdental to a labiodental in a change known as fronting. The rapid friction of the airflow in fricatives makes them unstable, making this kind of shift common. S and Z are simple, since they are simply alveolar fricatives, with the same point of articulation as T, D and N. One thing to point out here is that while T, D and N use the tip of the tongue, S and Z use the blade of the tongue, making them sound sibilant. Sh and j are sibilants too, and they also have special letters for them. They are pronounced with the tongue domed behind the alveolar ridge, so they can be called post-alveolar. J is voiced, and sh is voiceless. Sibilants are much more high-pitched and loud than other fricatives, since the blade of the tongue constricts the airflow more for longer and causes more friction, whether that be on the alveolar ridge or behind it. Let's look at now. I represent with an X symbol because it has no letter of its own. Since it's only found dialectally instead of standard K, as in Scouse Buch, or in loan words represented by the letters CH, which means something different in other contexts. It is a simple velar fricative, just like K, G, and N. English used to have a native velar fricative, which we'll look at later. It is always found unvoiced in English, but a voiced version would sound like this. <sighs> Last but not least, 
we have h, which is quite a special type of fricative. It is produced with a glottal constriction, which is where the flaps of the glottis open just far enough for air to pass through and undergo friction. Going back to our original question, we can now see that English has a fricative where the others have a stop. This is kind of similar to the question words pattern of the intro video. The Greek is unexplained for now, but we'll leave that for later. The fricative seemed to have a similar point of articulation to the stops, but shifted a bit. This can be explained by the instability of the fricatives. Remember when we talked about common origin? Well, this could mean that stops in this original language were preserved in the other languages, but became slightly shifted fricatives in English. An ancestral fricative is much less likely, since stops are more stable than fricatives. The explosive release of a stop has a high chance of developing into a fricative sound, eventually overtaking the stop part too. Congratulations, you have discovered Grimm's Law, a sound change that not only happened to English, but German, Norwegian, Swedish, Dutch, and more, at a point in time when all of these were the same language, before they all split up. We call these languages Germanic languages, which we will cover in a later video. This is why English, German, and Norwegian have fricatives instead of the stops that we saw in the other languages. The shifted fricatives were probably unshifted at an intermediate stage, which we can see clearly with the velas. We get a glimpse of the unshifted vela fricative before it turned to a glottal fricative in the spelling of English light, which is cognate with Greek levkos, which has a K. The GH spelling comes from a time when it was actually pronounced as a vela fricative. That pronunciation is still alive today in German Licht, which means the same thing. That's about as much as we can do without diving into language history, which is always a bit dangerous. We'll need a bit more knowledge to explore further, so if you enjoyed this video and would like to learn more, like, subscribe, and keep yourself updated on when the next linguistics video is coming out. I hope you got some insight into the history of language and became intrigued about the way speech sounds can evolve. Thanks for watching this video, and don't forget to keep learning.